Twim listeners, do you have science you want to share? Microworld.org is the best place to post your microbiology-related news articles, pictures, videos, papers, and more. Sign up for a free account at microworld.org slash join and start reaching thousands of microbiology enthusiasts just like yourself. This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 78, recorded on May 13th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from sunny, small things considered, Elio Schechter. Hi there. How are you? I hear it's hot out there. It's hot in San Diego, and it's dry, and we worry about fires, and we worry about the lack of water. Otherwise, it's paradise. Yeah, sometimes paradise has a little... Has cracks. It does. It does. Cracks We're really worried. Also joining us today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello. How's Charleston? It's a, a Chamber of Commerce day, 75, 80 <laughs> degrees. It's just like San Diego, except we have water. That's uh, nice. We have the humidity, uh, but we still also have a fire danger uh, up in the Francis Marion National Forest, and uh, it's been... Uh, dry and so just like the rest of the country we're worried about fires Mm. well here we're not it's uh, 68 degrees and uh, pretty cloudy not even warm here in new york city well we have two lovely papers today for you to digest and uh, michael you mind if i do the first one no please first one i found in plos pathogens it's called Host to pathogen gene transfer facilitated infection of insects by a pathogenic fungus. And the authors are Xiao, Xu, Lu, Chen, St. Ledger, and Fang. And the authors are from Zhejiang University in China and the University of Maryland over in College Park. And this paper is all about host switching. That is... You go from one host to another when microbes expand their host range. And what they're looking at here is how gene transfer from one organism to another is involved in host switching. So, for example, a gene a gene encoding a virulence factor was transferred from one fungus to another uh, somewhere around the 40s, leading to a more virulent fungus and a new disease of wheat. It's common to have gene transfer from bacteria to fungi, and there are also ex- examples of transfer between plants and either pathogenic fungi or pathogenic or parasitic plants. Also, gene transfer between eukaryotic pathogens and their animal host does, does take place, but at least among those studies, it seemed to be pretty rare. Now, the, the topic of this paper, fungi, these are common pathogens of insects, and they are understood to regulate insect populations, just like any good parasites do. And the the subject of this paper is Metarhizium robertsi. Elio, you ever heard of that one before? Uh, Sort of, but uh, I'm going to have to pipe in at some point about fungal taxonomy. Do you want me to say something now? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Okay. So, Here's the story. You give uh, fu- many fungi have two names, two Latin names, two linear names. How is that possible? Mm. Well, <clears throat> in many cases, what was the, the fungus has a sexual life stage. It makes a mushroom, for instance. In others, it doesn't. It's a mold. And when mm. they were discovered separately, and because of the rules of taxonomy, both names are valid. Can you imagine that? Mm. So the same organism, same DNA, same organism has two different names. They're called anamorphs. Okay. So this is 
I got to say, I'm not the most patient person when it comes to this, <laughs> and neither are some other people, because this is, it, it, it works also in, um, in uh, zoology, where there are some uh, animals that have a different name if they're a larva or if they are something if they're something else mm. <laughs> it, it, i sorry listeners that's the way it is now recently a bunch of young turks in mycology rose up and came up with the idea that uh, what given the amount of information they derive from DNA sequencing, having complete sequences of a number of things, you can do away with the whole thing. Mm. You can do away with that whole taxonomy and call it by a single term, a single name, give a name or a number or something and forget about this dual taxonomy. Certainly, it's it's embarrassing that you could, should... This guy, by the way, uh, the metarism uh, in a sexual form, is a cordyceps. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody knows what it is, but those are the guys who come out of insects' heads and make little mushroomy-like structures. And they are the guys who are used in China and elsewhere for uh, as uh, supplements. And they are uh, called winter fungus summer worm or vice versa. Anyhow, they're collected in Tibet in large amounts, they're sold for a lot of money, and they are used as strength enhancers. Hmm. Okay, you may have heard about this. And they're also a pure, they're a, a whole pharmacopoeia. They make a whole lot of stuff, uh, different compounds that are of different medical uses even. Hmm. Anyhow, so that's what this guy, so if this guy were... If the, if they had studied it as the sexual form, they would call it the cordyceps. If they studied it as the anamorph, namely the asexual form, it's called a metarhizum. Okay, metarhizum Robertsi. Is that how you say it, Robertsi or Robertsi? I guess depends what language you grew up with. <laughs> <laughs> the Italian would be Robert C. Robert C. But I'll call it Robert Sy. Robert C. Yes, right. And in addition to uh, being a uh, an insect pathogen, it's also an endophyte of plants. That is, it's an endosymbiont, lives within the plant. The plant is okay, and in this case, it helps promote the growth of the Yeah, it's better plant. than okay. It's better than it's okay. It's better, yeah. It promotes growth, right? Yeah. So this is an amazing case. I mean, this is this guy is a pathogen in one host right. and a beneficial organism, a beneficial symbiont in another. I mean, talk about skills. It's great. Now, there's some evidence that metarhizium acquired the ability to be pathogenic in insects at some point in the past. It no, it didn't always have it, in other words. And that's what they're exploring in this paper. How did this plant endophyte acquire the ability to cause damage in insects? So what they start is by mutating the genome of metarhizium by using what's called the tDNA and this is a plasmid found in agrobacterium, which you can use to deliver genes to plants. And you add the agros to plants, uh, you, you injure them, and you put the agrobacterium. The tDNA goes in and will integrate randomly in the genome. And so you can do mutagenesis, and then the tDNA is present wherever it goes in. So you can use it as a marker to pull out whatever gene it goes into. So what they do here is they, they make 328 insertion mutants, and they ask, uh, are they still virulent in an insect? And they use the caterpillar larvae of wax moths, which are called waxworm larvae. You can buy in the pet store, and you can feed to your uh, whatever you have that likes to eat insects. <laughs> 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 They're a very common thing to find in a pet store. And of these 328, one of them killed more slowly than the, uh, the wild-type fungus. Okay, so now they know exactly where the tDNA went into this genome, and they can see the gene. And the open reading frame of this gene, which was disrupted in this slow-killing fungal mutant, is a protein, is similar to a protein called Neiman-Pick type C2 protein. 
And this is a ver- this is a protein named after a disease, Neiman Pick disease, which is a disease of cholesterol transport. It's a fatal disease in people. And uh, the C2 in, uh, protein... Kids die young, don't they? Yes, they die very young. They don't get into their teens, really, yeah. And um, a transport of proteins. So it's very important for bringing cholesterol to the right place. You know, interestingly, in eukaryotic cells, uh, the Neiman Pick C1 protein, it's an endosomal transmembrane protein. It's a transporter. It also happens to be a receptor for Ebola virus. No kidding. So if you have Neiman Pick wow. type C1 disease, you will not ever be infected with Ebola. Huh. Of course, you don't live very long either, unfortunately. But they've used cells from those people to study the uh, the requirement for Ebola infection. Anyway, they delete separately. Well, we're all over the map of biology today, aren't we? Yeah, well, that's <laughs> just, we're just showing off, I guess. <laughs> the biology is just amazing. No matter what part you look at, it gets more and more amazing every day. And as I get older, I'm starting to understand it. Just starting. Just starting. Yeah. Actually, I'm learning what I don't know. Yeah. All right, so you delete this Neiman Pick type C2, we'll call it MPC2A gene, and it, it knocks out the virulence of the uh, wax moths. It, it doesn't completely get rid of it, but it reduces it. And so there's still some residual virulence. Now, this deletion doesn't affect growth of the fungus on plates. So what about insects? So here's what happens when this fungus infects an arthropod. So the conidia, the spores, the sexual conidia, they contact... Oh, asexual. Asexual? asexual. Not sexual. Okay, I got an asexual because I, I left off the A here in my notes. Or yeah. your spell checker fixed it for you. Maybe. Asexual conidia <laughs> contact the arthropod uh, as it's flying around or sitting on a plant. And the conidia stick to the outside. And this is the amazing. They germinate and they grow a germ tube which ends in what's called an apressorium, <laughs> okay? And this ends up penetrating, uh, piercing the integument and enters the body cavity, which is called the hemocele. It develops this thing so it can inject uh, itself into the insect. And Sounds ma- like type 3 secretion. You know it. No, no, it's a whole... The whole cell, the type of secretion, well, yeah. the protein. Yeah, this is the whole cell yeah. going in, the whole structure. And th- and as Ilya alluded to earlier, this fungus makes a cocktail of enzymes and proteases, lipases, chitinases, and, a- and the pressure of the uh, appressorium gets it into the hemocele. Then single cells of the fungus bud off. They circulate in the hemocele of the insect and they multiply. Okay, and they also make compounds that are toxic to the insect as well, and eventually uh, kills the insect. They have immune defense suppressors. It's just amazing. Eventually, the host, the insect, will die. The fungus comes out of the uh, integument, grows on conidia fours, at the end of which are conidia, so long stalks with spores at the end, and those get disseminated and find a new host. It's really amazing that uh, all of this happens. So this is how these fungi infect hosts. They spread within the body cavity and then get out again. Okay, so back to the experiment. If you uh, infect wax wax worms with um, the wild-type fungus, they all die. If you infect with the mutant, deleted in the NPC2A gene, 40% of those survive. And that's for the original tDNA mutant as well as the gene deletion that they made later. And then they also make a complementing strain where they put the gene back into a deleted strain and they show that that kills uh, all of the worms as well. So this this gene seems to be really involved in, in virulence of this fungus in insects. Uh, they look at the formation of the appressoria. I like that word, appressoria. <laughs> by the mutant on loc- here they use locusts to study this it's the same it doesn't the deletion of the npc2a gene does not affect the formation of the appressoria so presumably getting in is not affected but inside of the in the body in the hemolymph the fluid that circulates in the hemocele there are fewer hyphal bodies in the mutant strain compared with wild type 
So the the implication is that disruption of this gene uh, is is affecting some stage after the fungus actually gets into the hemocele. It's not affecting the attachment or the penetration steps. Okay, so that's what it does in the animal. Now, what about these genes, NPC2? So they they looked at the genomes of of, of fungi that are available in in this uh, Metarhizium robertsi. There are three proteins that look like MPC2. And all of them have cholesterol binding sites. Okay. Yeah, the MPC2A, which is the one uh, that... that um, oh, sorry. MPC2A. There's MPC2A, 2B, and 2C. Uh, they all have this sterile binding site, but A, A and B are very different from C. B and C are widespread in fungi, and A are found in only two other fungi besides uh, M. Robertsi. So remember, the uh, the gene we're looking at here, the one was disrupted, is NPC2A. Okay. NPC2A are found only in Robertsi. Another fungus called Claviceps purpurea. It's ergot. An ergot. What mm-hmm. is an ergot fungus, uh, Elio? An ergot fungus is one that affects uh, cereals mm-hmm. like um, barley and, uh, and rye. Uh, rye, especially R- rye, and uh, grows in the uh, fruit or in the in the in the, uh, in the edible part of the plant, and makes banana-shaped structures, which are called sclerotia which are sort of a collection of hyphae, a collection of filaments designed to withstand um, mm. drying and so forth. And they are, in the pharm- they talk about pharmacology, they are a whole pharmacology onto themselves and make ergot ca- alkaloids of all kinds of sorts, which are used in medicine and which, if not used in medicine, but ingested accidentally, cause a disease called ergotism, which mm. is bad news. Hmm. We'll talk about that some other time. Okay, so er, Claviceps purpurea and the Metarhizium robertsi and Metarhizium acridum, these are the only fungi where they find NPC2A homologs. All right. You can find them in insects and in vertebrates. Uh, our Claviceps and Cordyceps, which is what this guy is, hmm. are fairly related fungi. Yeah. So. So you can find these NPC2A homologs in insects and vertebrates, but you don't find them in plants, bacteria, archaea, or viruses. Mm. So they think that uh, C. purpurea and metarhizium species acquired NPC2A from insects rather than vertebrates. So the, the, the phylogenetic analysis suggests this. Also, they argue that these fungi don't really hang out with vertebrates they they have more contact with uh, insects, and so it's more likely that it was transferred. And on the phylogenetic tree, you can see very clearly that the, the NPC2A sequences of Metarhizium and Purpurea cluster with the insect sequences. So they form a cluster all by themselves, separate from the other NPC2A sequences. So this is the idea that they originated from insects. If you look at the genes around... Um, the NPC2A gene in the genome of these fungi suggests that uh, it was acquired before the two species diversified, which is about 30 to 40 million years ago. Okay, and so M. robertsi and M. acridum, they're in a similar genomic context. However, it's, it's quite different from the genomic context of C. purpurea, in which NPC2A lies. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So then they did some nice experiments to study the function of the NPC2A protein. They produced the protein in E. coli, they purified it, and they found that it binds to cholesterol and lipid A, which are absent in fungi. Fungi have ergosterol. It does not bind to fungal ergosterol. And this is very similar to the NPC2A protein from the fruit fly, another insect, of course, and very different from yeast NPC2A, which does not bind sterol, it binds ergosterol. So this is part of the story, which is development. They also look at the expression of the gene by real-time PCR, and they don't find any 
NPC two AM RNA in the aerial hyphae, the mycelium, and the canidia from M. Robertsi grown on plates, or from Appressoria grown on the locusts. So no uh, expression of this gene in any of those places. However, they do find the mRNA in hyphal bodies that are from the hemolymph of insects. So these are the branching structures of fungi, and these are present in the blood, and they ex- produce NPC2A. And they also do a, some nice experiments where they put GFP, uh, they fuse GFP to the protein, and they see fluorescence only after the fungus has penetrated the insect. So it, the, the expression of NPC2A seems to be specific to, again, the hemocele. So, hemocele in the hemolymph of the insects. How it's induced isn't known. They tried inducing with steroids and insect hormone, stress, oxidative stress, hypoxia, osmotic stress. None of these things induced the production of NPC2A mRNA. So, that's a question that remains to be determined. Now, back to the mutant. If you infect uh, worms with the mutant fungus and you look at the sterile content of hyphal bodies in these insects. The mutant uh, hyphal bodies have a lower content of sterile compared to wild type. Okay, so the idea is that sterols are needed as the fungus grows and as the, uh, the mutant is not able to get the sterols that it needs. This absence of sterols makes the the cells permeable to a a, a nucleic acid dye that would normally get into wild-type cells very poorly. So it's about 5% staining of wild-type fungi with this dye. But in the deletion mutant lacking MPC2A, you get over 50% of the cells staining. So the membrane integrity uh, of the fungus is, is, is related to the presence of MPC2A. Uh, the last experiment that they do is they take another fungus, which is pathogenic for insects. It's called Bovaria bassiana. Okay, Bovaria bassiana. doesn't have genes related to NPC2A. So what they did is they put the gene into Bovaria, didn't alter its growth, didn't alter its spore formation or germination, but... The amount of time it took to kill half of the insects into which it was introduced was reduced by 22%, so it kills them faster when it has the NPC2A. It makes them more pathogenic. Mm. So what they think here is that Metarhizium acquired this sterile carrier gene, NPC2A, from an insect host, and that, that allowed Metarhizium to adapt to growth in the hemolymph Okay, so the idea is that hemolymph is either very low or oxygen-free. Right? Normally, uh, the, the fungus can make ergosterol de novo, but that requires oxygen. So when the fungus gets into the hemolymph of the insect, it's anaerobic, and so now it's got to get sterol, and it can do that with a sterile binding protein. That's why it needs NPC2A. All right, so you take away NPC2A, it can't acquire the sterols it needs, it doesn't grow as well, and the virulence is reduced. Hmm. Now, it's not a, the virulence is not eliminated, so there must be other genes that can step in uh, to a certain extent. Um, so that's pretty neat. So it acquired this gene from insects, and then it's using it so obviously there was some selection to acquire this and maintain this gene to be able to replicate in the hemocele of the insect. And their 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 idea, they want to know like why did did it get this gene and how. Their idea is that uh, one of these two fungi, C. purpurea or metarhizum, acquired it and then passed it to the other fungus. And they, they don't think, there's some other ideas for how this happened, but they think that's what happened and they need to do more genome sequencing to sort this out. So I guess at some point uh, many years ago, an insect picked up one of these fungi and it got into it and then somehow it acquired uh, a gene from uh, the insect and that gave it the uh, the ability to uh, reproduce better and, and move on. Hmm. What do you think? I think of all the scenarios, <laughs> it's the most probable. Uh, you know, this story is, is great great for the science fiction horror genre because you know 
you said it was acquired 30 to 40 million years ago. Yeah. And so the when I was reading this, thinking about it, I said, uh, wouldn't this could this actually adapt to mammals and are mammals just too new that we haven't been living uh, with fungi as intimately to allow natural selection to effectively allow fungi to come out of our heads. Um, yeah, that's you know, what happens to these insects. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a horror movie. Uh, what's, what's going on, but it, it really illustrates that the genome uh, or whatever term we want to use is is really pretty plastic yeah. to living creatures. They'll they'll take DNA from anything as mm. long as it confers a selective advantage to that particular species. And the behavior that the fungus is manifesting is it after it's done the good for the the I guess bigger organism, or is it uh, in is it a lethal event for the bigger organism? And in this case, we see both situations. Depends on which, yeah. Yeah. It, it goes back to what Elio was talking about with some of these um, Chinese herbalists where it's, um, you know, a winter fungus summer worm and how they have taken advantage of that uh, phenomenon uh, in order to do good things for you know, natural medicines that are all the rage now for big pharma because they really want to understand what's actually going on with this unusual chemistry. And I think that's really fundamental here. You, you, radio doesn't or, or podcasts don't actually lend themselves to some of the phenomenal structures that are being created by these fungi. It's uh, it's easy enough to go to YouTube and find it though. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. There's uh, BBC had several programs on this with uh, uh, what's his name, the guy, the wonderful biologist. Uh, uh, oh, anyhow, uh, go to YouTube and uh, put in horror movies of uh, uh, insects and fungi, <laughs> and you find it. Yeah, I I think this is also ties into my quest to understand virulence of microbes. And here you'll have this fungus, which is not virulent years, millions of years ago because it could not propagate in the hemocele of insects. It acquires a single gene that allows it to continue to grow by having sterols, using sterols from the yes. insect. By the way, I didn't mention, but the insects are full of sterols. Uh, that the fungus can use. And then, of course, the fungus is making all these other compounds that were, which are probably all playing a role in killing the insect, but they're making it for other purposes, I would guess. And what's interesting to me is that after the millions of years of the fungus infecting the insect, the, the two have not come to harmony with each other. No. Mm. You know, many uh, virus-host interactions come to a point where it's good for both but not here. I no. W- I wonder why that is. It could be because the differentiation of their life cycle. You have the larval stage and the adult stage and the nymph stage. And it's so, when the fungus adds to it. Yeah. Hmm. Elio, were you thinking of David Attenborough? That's right. Thank you. Yep. That's yeah, it would drive it would drive person. me crazy if if I didn't <laughs> figure out you know, when, when you get one of those names that you can see the person's face. and <laughs> All right, now we have something totally different. Something completely different. Uh, this paper is entitled, Are Community Environmental Surfaces Near Hospitals Reservoirs for Gram-Negative Nosocomial Pathogens? The paper is by Drs. Michael Rose, David Landman, and John Qual. I wanted to say quail, but there's no Y. It's qual. Q U A L E. But, you know, it's the popular, you know, you see the Q U and you just want to go there. And they're at the SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. As some of you know from longtime listeners of TWIM, this is a uh, subject that's near and dear to my heart. The spread of microbes within the hospital environment that lead to in infections while you're 
hospitalized. And it's a big problem for the developed world, for the developing world, for every place. And it's been recently reviewed extensively in um, the 27 March issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, where they looked at the hospital-associated infection rates in hospitals in the United States. They updated the rate. So they looked at 183 hospitals, and the rate continues to hold. This HAI rate continues to hold. Uh, Ten years ago, it was about 1 in 20. Today, it's about 1 in 25, or about Mm. 4%. So it's still a pretty substantial infection rate. And many of the patients that were positive for HAIs had more than one infection. And they're the ones that you don't want, like uh, Clostridium difficile, which gives you chronic diarrhea. And But I, but I digress there. So the intent of, of this paper is to assess the risk around the hospital. In addition to looking inside the hospital, Hospital infection control professionals are beginning to look at how these these multi-drug resistant bacteria get into the hospital. And so the intent of this paper is to assess the ring of risk around the hospital. And we all know that hospital visitors and staff uh, visit neighboring businesses, creating the potential for contamination of surfaces within the hospital, effectively generating the hospital's micro environment. Last week, um, I heard a seminar from uh, Dr. Vince Young, who says that we should never use the word flora because bacteria are not flowers. (laughs) Do bacteria produce flowers is what Vince's charge to the audience was, and I have to agree with them. Bacteria, with the exception of the uh, mixobacteria that make fruiting bodies, they don't really produce flowers, unlike the fungi. So, we're looking for the potential for contamination of surfaces that generate this hospital microfauna, if you will. And many of you probably watched with interest um, the movement of, of MRSA methicillin resistant staph aureus move from causing the majority of hospital acquired pneumonias in the intensive care unit to now what we know that MRSA is one of the leading causes of community acquired pneumonia pneumonias that you get out when you're staying at home and so the question is how does a drug resistant pathogen move And, of course, we only need to open the paper in the last two weeks to really appreciate how microorganisms move. You just have to look at uh, MERV-CoV that I think Vincent has probably discussed on on TWIV, first reaching Indianapolis, and now it's in Orlando. And the last time I was to Disney World, um, I didn't see any camel races going on, so (laughs) – so. How did the MERV CoV virus spell out move? MERV? MERS, spell out MERS. MERS. What does it, I'm sorry. What does it stand for? Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. Thank you. It travels in infected people on airplanes. That's right. So that's how it got to the land of the mouse. Fortunately, it doesn't get very far once it gets to the land of the mouse. It's not a very transmissible virus. And and it was a, a individual who had been to the Middle East that brought it here and it appears to be fortunately so so far a dead end you know they they come in they cause disease and and they drop out and that's because you need camels to start the <laughs> infection and then once there's no camels that's it it doesn't go person to person very well yeah. so, all, so you know what i'm sorry to yeah. interrupt all this crazy headlines about mers corona boy just relax yeah Well, that's why I brought it up here, because what we're going to talk about today is actually far more dangerous than MERS. And what these authors did is the tried and true. They did shoe leather epidemiology, where they went out in an ever-expanding arc, assessing from the hospital surfaces, looking in the lobbies of hospitals... And they looked at six hospitals in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn, New York is an area that has about 
2.6 million people in it. So it's it's pretty substantial. And there are about 6,000 hospitals in, in the United States, give or take. And they looked at these contaminated objects within the hospital setting. So they went and they principally surveyed door handles and um, handrails because effectively, how do you get into the hospital? You either open the door, you climb up some steps. And so they felt that that would be a good area to look for multi-drug resistant bacteria to see if they're moving in and then in this ever-expanding arc, to see whether or not you could find multi-drug resistant gram-negative microbes as you moved away from, from the hospital. And we, of course, appreciate that uh, everybody is very concerned about, uh, you've probably heard of KPC, which is Klebsiella pneumonia that actually has in residence the carbapenemase, which is an enzyme that degrades beta-lactam drugs, which are penicillin, cephalosporins, and of course, the, the, its namesake, carbapenem. And when microbes acquire the carbapenemase trait, they become recalcitrant to all of the um, beta-lactams that we have in our armamentarium, with the exception of a, a certain uh, few, because they're, they're bringing these antibiotic resistance traits on what are termed integrons, which is nothing more than a genetic unit that actually harbors this um, antibiotic uh, resistance characteristic. And so, little is known about the hospital, but even less is known about the risk associated with the microbes as you move away from from the hospital. And the authors bring to everyone's attention for more than 10 years, New York City has been plagued with multidrug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Acinetobacter bomani, which is affectionately referred to as A-bomb, and KPC, which is this nasty Klebsiella. And then, of course, the CDC, there's this special place in hell for the taxonomists that name antibiotic resistance. They renamed KPC as the generic evil to CRE, which is carbapenemase resistant Enterobacteraceae, mm. which are these gram <laughs> negatives that uh, harbor uh, this carbapenemase. And so, um, what these authors did is they went out and sampled, and they looked at locations within one mile less than one mile to the hospital. Um, and then they looked as their control regions that were greater than one and a half miles from the hospitals because they figure the hospital staff and the visitors would frequent the, the coffee shops and the cafes that were in relative proximity to the restaurant and the workers would use the doors to get into the restaurants and coffee shops and yeah. The microbes would move with them. <laughs> usually you need to use the door. <laughs> you knew you need to usually use the door to get in and out uh, because the coffee shops don't have typically automatic doors like grocery stores. And that so been they a good, also, that would have been a good control, a grocery store, automatic door. Yeah, and just sample that. And so mm. the cultures um, were obtained. Um, they sampled with pre-moistened, um, swabs that had calcium alginate, and then they inoculated them into Mueller Hinton broth. And Mueller Hinton broth is a rich medium. It's it's effectively a digestion of, of beef extract, uh, starch, and casein, which is milk protein. So it's effectively you know your garden variety mammal. And so they sample <laughs> the, they good. they sample the surface, they put the swab in the liquid, they grow it up, and that's really important because they're not placing any adverse selective pressure on the microbe. They're pulling off of it a dry surface, they're putting it into a liquid medium, and what most folks don't appreciate is the phase transition often kills a substantial number of bacteria. So you can under-report if you're just looking 
for how many colonies you get. You you sort of have to control for that. So the fact how do you that do that? How do you do that? Well, you count the bugs and uh, you uh, do a membrane integrity test with redox sensitive dyes to ask the question: Are the bacteria able to exclude a redox dye? So they're mm. viable but non-culturable, and there's there's a whole set of tricks that the CDC is exploring to sample because this has now gotten the attention of the CDC because, again, one of the stories we did at um, ICAC is we talked about NDM, which is a variant of this evil carbapenemase. It's a metallo beta lactamase. And, of course, that moved from New Delhi to Sweden, and, of course, it's now moved all throughout Europe. And it's, of course, resistant to a, a large number of things. So these authors were very careful in their work. They collected uh, a large number of, of samples from all these six different hospitals. They were collecting about 100 samples each from locations near the hospital, and then they had, um, as their controls, uh, other areas. And after you grow them up in the mueller Hittenbroth, you then take a fraction and you plate it on a selective and differential medium that will specifically enrich for this Enterobacteraceae, and that's McConkie's auger. And I'll put a picture in the show notes for McConkie agar because McConkie agar asks the question, can you ferment lactose as a carbon source? And when you ferment lactose, you turn this um, pink color. And if you are unable to ferment lactose, you're just white on the, on, the, on the Petri plate. And it's got a pH indicator in there. So it's a nice color metric indicator. And then what they did is they picked colonies and they figured out who was there. And then they asked the question, do you have a suite of genes that we're concerned about? And they were specifically looking for resistance to the cephalosporins um, and the carbapenemases because that's the ones that they were concerned with. And then they went off and looked for the genes to the beta-lactamases. And the genes to the beta-lactamases can give you an idea of how the microbes are moving because the genes, there's a beta-lactamase OX48, there's a beta-lactamase OX58, and the list goes on and on. And then they look for the evil one, the beta-lactamase New Delhi uh, one that everybody is, of course, terrified with. And if you're interested, they they published the PCR primers that they used in order to assess for this. So it was really a... Um, pretty cool study about how they set it up and they went on this survey. And in their table of the data, they report on the hospital and they and you can see they looked at everything from bakery doors to diner doors to pizza parlors to pizza donut parlor shops. Like <laughs> donut shops, subway doors, subway handle hand railings, uh, internet internet cafe, the ubiquitous deli in New York. Uh, sidewalk water fountain and uh, restaurant bathroom. And then they actually looked at eight grocery doors. And those were the ones that were actually reporting out resistance to um, the cephalosporin and the carbapenemase, the cephadizamine and imipenem. And so uh, they got all this data and they sum it up by saying there were two noteworthy observations involving the investigation of the community uh, environmental surfaces surrounding these hospitals in Brooklyn, New York. The first is the finding of a single strain of Acinetobacter bomani that contaminated uh, community surfaces, especially around one of their area hospitals. And they also found the same strain as a clinical isolate. So that really goes to show you that the bacteria are moving between, you know, subway doors, pizza parlors, into our hospitals where they actually um, recover it from people. But that by itself is not that surprising. Um, How do we know this went from 
couldn't these go from the hospital to these doors? Oh, yes. We don't know they're going back in now, right? Well, they had to get into the hospital because they recovered it from the patient. Yeah. So they could have, the patient could have brought it with them. Yeah, so that's uh, the thing I don't understand. I mean, the healthcare worker on the lunch break brings it to the pizza shop, right? But what's yeah. what's the problem? Unless you show that it can go back in or infect someone, I don't know what the problem is, right? Well, causality is is hard to demonstrate because yeah. we have, other than genus and species and maybe subspecies, it's really hard to tag bacteria. It's not like catch and release fish. <laughs> if we could come up with a way to catch and release bacteria so we could follow them, that would be great. I mean, I think the greatest study was the one, I don't know, done in Europe, where they looked in grocery stores at the chicken and identified bacterial strains with certain antibiotic resistance markers. And then in the, in the neighboring hospital, they found the same strains with the same isolates. Oh, yeah. You know, so you, you prepare your chicken, you get colonized by these bacteria, and then when you get sick, there you go. I mean, but I don't know what having it on a door means, just that it's there, you know. It means it's there. <laughs> it means it's there. And uh, but they're basing the their their argument for significance in that there's a wide body of infectious disease literature that shows that um, contamination of inanimate surfaces, particularly ICUs, uh, commonly occurs in patients infected or colonized with this a bomb creature, mm. and admission to a hospital room previously occupied by an A-bomb infected individual has been demonstrated to be a higher risk factor for the infection of the new patient by the same A-bomb. And uh, it's involved in the transmission of that pathogen. And, and finally, the third piece of data that they pulled from the literature is approximately 40 to 50% of the rooms occupied by a patient with A-bomb have at least one positive environmental culture, typically with the same strain as recovered from that patient. So they're arguing that A-bomb is likely the guy that's moving it amongst uh, the environment on the street and the hospital. So, Michael, when they went beyond... A certain radius do they find no anything? it drops off it okay. drops off all right so that and suggests that it's coming from the hospital workers right it suggests it's coming from the hospital workers and their sec second significant finding was this isolate uh that had an integron associated with uh, a beta lactamase vim2 which they report as very disconcerting but because they had never seen vim2 in new york city before and this particular uh, metallo beta lactamase is frequently found in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but spread to the Enterobacteriaceae while documented. It had not yet been documented in New York. And mm. given the fact that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is this ubiquitous antibiotic resistant creature that runs amok, it could be the one that's actually the reservoir that then a bomb exchanges information with it and it moves amongst it and the other thing is they're arguing that um in new york city they should uh begin to detect go hunting for this uh beta lactamase vim-2 because it may be undetected by the current protocols used by their um, mm -hmm. clinical laboratories and again it's all about using the right drug at the right time because there are suites of drugs that they use empirically but if you have one of these multi-drug resistance you want to switch up your regime based on the antibiogram of your Originally, antibiograms were developed for hospitals, knowing which drugs work on the microbes associated with the hospital. But this paper is making a strong argument that we really need to begin to move our antibiogram to the surrounding area and even perhaps our 
patient catchment area where patients are, you know, hospitals typically collect patients from the surrounding areas. And maybe we need doctors to, you know, swab doctor's offices to see what their patients are leaving behind in routine visits. Mm. And that may give us a better understanding of what's going on. The other thing that I thought about when I was reading this is at my institution, the um, cafeteria is common. Staff and visitors actually use the same cafeteria, and everybody sits together uh, mixed up wherever there's a vacant table. Yeah, I think and it's so, very true in most hospitals. So the question is, should the staff eat in a different spot from the visitors, since it could be the visitors who aren't subject to the same aggressive hand hygiene guidelines who may be bringing the bugs that we leave behind uh, as healthcare workers, and then the visitors pick them up and take them to see mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. Mm. So, Mike, uh, so what do you do, Michael? Put copper doorknobs everywhere? Ah. Uh, co- copper doorknobs <laughs> could work because it will reduce the burden yeah. on thing. And in fact, um, we're currently working on a paper. We looked um, at a very famous railroad station in Manhattan that <laughs> that had that should be remain nameless because uh, we haven't gotten the release to talk about them yet. But they they are a very famous railroad station that has lots of copper in it, and um, that copper is at least seventy five years old, and it's still working pretty good. Nice, ah. very nice. I don't know if the thing in, that I noticed on this paper is the, the highest level of resistance are the isolates from the bathroom doorknob, right? Yeah. Because that's well, the, the most contaminated, right? People have terrible hand hygiene after they come out of the bathroom. after they It use also it. may be a function of survival. Yeah, it's because true. Because the, the bugs are fresher coming out of the, the, the bathroom door than they are on, hopefully, the pizza parlor door. Yeah. I don't know what you can do about this. Do you have any? I mean, aside from telling people to wash their hands, what else? Copper is not going to make it to every doorknob anytime soon. Copper is not going to make it to every doorknob. But at the same time, I think what I would do is really, that's why I said, think about developing an antibiogram of the patient catchment area. Mm. You know, go into a doctor's office and, and swab the arms of the chair maybe on a monthly basis and ask the question about what antibiotic resistance is present. And similarly do that in some common sentinel areas so that you can actually use the right drugs at the right time to cut down on, you know, giving bacteria the selective pressure of using empiric drugs that generally work. Uh, Brooklyn is a very dense, packed location. It's got two and a half million people in a very tight area. There's only four million people in the entire state of of South Carolina and two and a half million in Brooklyn. And, you know, Brooklyn is next to Queens and Queens has at least uh, a million plus people as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think the New York Health Department has done a phenomenal job protecting the population of of New York City. And it it may be something that, you know, they have the resources that they could actually, you know, do a small study to see what's actually going on. Yep. Nice story. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Should be thought-provoking. Let's read a couple of emails here. We have a follow-up to our last episode from Adele, who writes, I was looking forward to this discussion after hearing you hint about it in a previous podcast. As a practicing ID doc, I have been fascinated by the difference in pain induced by cellulitis from presumed or proven staph or strep infections. I see some patients whose pain resolves in a day or so after antibiotics, and some fewer patients who have a much more protracted course of pain with tenderness to minimal touch or change in position. I have suspected that different isolates produce different toxins to explain these clinical differences, as my clinical judgment and experience argues that patient personality differences or pain thresholds are simply not enough explanation for the variation I see. 
It also seems to be there or not be there more distinctly than a simple continuum would explain. I am grateful for the basic science work being done in the field at present and for your discussion. Thanks to you for all the work you put into this podcast. I am learning every week and finding connections in areas I would never have before considered. Adele is an associate professor at Michigan State University. I just love it that clinicians are listening to TWIM. <laughs> now, this was the episode we talked about how bacteria make pain by tickling neurons, and it's a way of immunomodulating. Just amazing. Just amazing. And if we could figure out how to tinker with that yeah. pain threshold, it would be much better than a narcotic. Next one is from Jeffrey, who writes, Good doctors, I realize that this is a bit behind the times, but I have two questions related to beta-lactamase. Hope I got that right. From episodes 6, Antibacterial Therapy with Bacteriophage. One, we all know that the proliferation of bacterial resistance to antibiotics has a direct influence on infection recovery in humans and animals. What I'm pretty sure most people forget is that most antibiotics began their careers as part of microbial defense systems. Are you folks aware of any studies looking at the effects of increasing antibiotic resistance in environmental microbiomes? I would think that this human-induced change has got to be skewing microbial populations and interactions. Indeed, I'm having trouble even imagining the, what the impacts on the microbial and therefore macrobial world might be. Michael? I think we only need to go to a sewage treatment plant and to answer that question, and we can probably do take a page from today's study looking at the PCR primers and just doing simple quantitative PCR on nucleic acid we can extract from some of the anaerobic sludge digesters, the aerobic uh, settling ponds, and ask you know, is it better or worse than other communities? And some folks have begun to do that. I I occasionally come across a paper that looks at the antibiotic resistance in sewage treatment plants, and, and that's the place I would initially look because, you know, we have antibiotics in our food, we eat antibiotics, and a lot of us flush antibiotics down the toilet when, you know, we find them in our medicine cab and say, well, how long has this been here? Yep, yep. But I, I thought that really there were quite a few studies of the sort, Michael. I, I, um, there are. There are. There are quite a few. There's, it's, it, looking for antibiotic resistance in natural environments is, is almost a commonplace. I thought there's a lot of studies like that. It is. You find it everywhere. But the question is, would, is our dumping antibiotics into the environment, is it doing anything to populations out there? The, uh, last, the last study I saw was a study funded by NOAA, and they were looking at a pristine watershed, and then they were looking right. at yeah, uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, which is very touristy, and they were finding um, antibiotic resistance in the pristine watershed from the animals that were defecating into the water, whether they be domesticated or wild. And they thought they were wild, and so the wild animals are actually picking up antibiotic resistance. And it was a NOAA study, and I'll have to go and hunt for that reference. I read it about a year and a half ago, if I'm remembering right. Uh, to continue with Jeffrey's email, to during your discussion of beta-lactamase gene development in the environment, I thought of a possible counter that might help us continue to use beta-lactam antibiotics a little longer. Are you aware of any groups who are researching anti-beta-lactamase drugs that could be added to antibiotics, allowing the beta-lactams to retain some effectiveness against resistant microbes. If someone developed a low-toxicity drug that had significantly higher and one would like non-reversible affinity for beta-lactamase than beta-lactam, then one could presumably administer it along with beta-lactam and it would activate the beta-lactamase while leaving the lactam free to do its work. Such a system probably wouldn't be effective within a micro, but it should be effective for running interference at cell membranes. Thanks for the interesting shows. That oh, yeah. is a brilliant idea that's actually in clinical practice. It's called clavulonic acid. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And they use that with beta-lactams to expand their spectrum. It may not specifically work just as he's laid out his mechanism, but clavulonic acid is, a, is one of the ones uh, that does it. Right. 
All right, Robin writes, consolidation, Dr. Schmidt's viral illness would be quite serious <laughs> if there was consolidation as was asserted. Consolidation refers to the gross characteristics of the lung when it turns from fluffy and pliant into solid as the air spaces become filled with cellular and proteinaceous exudates and pneumonias. Bad enough with bacteria and the antibiotic resistance problem, if it is a viral pneumonia, the treatment modalities are mostly supportive care. Well, I guess, Michael, you did not have consolidation because no, you're still was, with us. It was hyperbole. Sounded be- good. Sounded good. <laughs> it was, it was you hyperbole. Were, you got anybody's sympathy. <laughs> it, was, it was hyperbole, and what I was fishing for is this exact email because that's what we like to see is, yep. is uh, coming out explaining what uh, pneumonia is. Yeah. And to the basic scientist – it feels like your lung is full of crap, when in reality it's not. Well, as you say, Michael, we're going to get email. Yes, we love email. My, Matt writes, hello, it's been found that nasal carriage of Staph aureus is associated with increased risk of infection due to dispersal of SA from the nose while breathing and by nose picking and not washing your hands. Some individuals are colonized with SA and are more prone to infection. Now there's a lot of research on how best to decolonize the nose of SA because it survives antibiotics and quickly recolonizes the body. Mupirocin is typically used, but the results are not good and resistance is likely. Seems to me that the aim of decolonization is stupid since it's impossible to kill every last cell in and on the body. And even if you could, there's plenty more in an individual's environment which can survive for months on surfaces to recolonize them anyway. Surely a better aim is to find out why some people do not become colonized and reproduced whatever they have in colonized people. Presumably there's something about uncolonized people's immune systems and or microbiomes which makes it hard for Staph aureus to become a problem. Maybe it's like the problem some people have with gut bite bacteria where gut bacteria transplants have been shown to be effective. Maybe similar transplants of bacteria from the skin and or nose of uncolonized individuals would be as effective for SA depopulation. It's a revolting idea, but no more disgusting than a poo transplant. Ooh. (laughs) What What do you think of a nose transplant, Michael? I think it's coming. It's coming. Uh, yeah, I think he's, uh, he's on to it. Think, I think it's coming. I think that and uh, periodontal, mm. periodontal uh, for periodontal disease yeah. will be coming. Good idea. All right. One more from Ravi. I'm sorry, Matthew, not Ravi. Professor Racaniello didn't recognize speak friend and enter and NIN. What kind of barbarians do you invite on this show? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Twim73 was another amazing and wonderful podcast. I am only a geologist, so I can sometimes only vaguely hum along with yours, my, Michelle's, and Michael's biochemistry areas. Nonetheless, Twim is one of my favorite podcasts. When I listen on my walking commute from my home to my office in Seattle, I arrive smarter and grateful. I am always grateful after listening. Thank you. Ah, oh, Isn't that nice? Very That's nice. That's a nice way to end it. Yes, we, we you, love our, our email writers. This episode of TWIM will be found at iTunes and also at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And as always, we love getting your questions and comments. Send them to TWIM, T-W-I-M, at TWIV.TV. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you for joining us today, Elio. Oh, my pleasure as always. And have good travels to the wonderful general meeting of the American Society for Microbiology. I hope to see you there. It starts next week or starts on Saturday. Yep. It should be a lot of fun. It's in my old home, my old hometown. Oh, that's right. That's right. You're going to be home. You must be going to all your old haunts, right? Uh, Who's got the time? (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent. We will also see you in Beantown. Ah, yes. Michelle Swanson will be there. We we have a reunion of TWIM in Boston. How about that? Yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 